Hi, everybody. Welcome. Rob Dickinson with Urology Austin. And hi, I'm Lucy. I'm Dr. Dickinson's nurse practitioner. Okay. Bear with me, everyone. I'm getting the... program started. Um, so I'm going to kick off our presentation today, talk to you a little about some symptoms you might be experiencing. Uh, many people feel exhausted, overwhelmed with urinary symptoms, but often are too embarrassed to talk about it. Embarrassment is a real issue of concern. You can see on the slide, as many as 44% of people who have bladder control problems um, do not talk about it with their providers, haven't felt confident discussing the issue, so they go on with progressive, very difficult, even debilitating symptoms. If you are feeling such symptoms, you are not alone. You could be suffering from overactive bladder, and we have options that we'll walk through today, kind of talking about what overactive bladder looks like and options for treatment that might be the right fit for you. So take a look at this slide, see if any of these uh, symptoms sound familiar. I often have patients coming in um, that describe symptoms of urgency, frequency. We kind of think of urgency as the sensation of, if I don't get to the bathroom right now, I might have an accident. Frequency, those are my patients that know every stop, um, every bathroom stop between their house and the grocery store because inevitably they have to stop with even short car rides and things like that. And again, you are not alone. Incontinence is a, use, is a word that we use when people have leakage, urinary leakage, um, for the purpose of today's presentation, could be fecal leakage as well, um, where you find yourself needing to change pants, underwear, wear pads often, even find yourself drinking less water because you're concerned that you might be having issues or accidents. You're not. Uh, you are in good company. One in six adults have bladder issues, overactive bladder. That's as many as 43 million adults. And again, can really impact your daily life. People don't sleep as well. They don't feel comfortable going out to social events um, and feel too embarrassed to discuss it. The good news is bowel and bladder treatments can uh, help you have more freedom in your life. We'll talk a little bit about things that can cause bladder and bowel control problems. Can you go back a second? Sure. Okay. Um, just reading through this slide, uh, you know, um, I think it's kind of limiting as far as, you know, what the causes are for people to have uh, particularly overactive bladder or incontinence. Um, this is not limited to just women. Uh, I probably do. I would say as much as a third of my interstim, uh, you know, procedures in men. Um, and most of the time, the causes are not uh, identifiable. Some people just have overactive bladder urge incontinence. Uh, men with enlarged prostates often develop this as well. Uh, people of both genders, you know, with problems with strokes, uh, history of stroke or Parkinson's, or even multiple sclerosis can develop these issues as well. Um, so it's a, a pretty wide net that catches, uh, you know, people with this problem. I uh, just wanted to emphasize that. Go ahead, Lucy. Okay, thanks. So this is gonna give you guys just a very basic background of how the bladder works in the body, which will make more sense when we move forward with different treatment options. So brief overview is that bladder function involves, like most things in life, good communication. As your bladder fills with urine, nerves in your brain tell your bladder that it needs to be emptied. However, for some people, their bladder begins to fill and the brain goes ahead and tells you that it's time to empty even when it's not full yet. That's when you experience things like urgency, I gotta get to the bathroom right now, frequency, I was just in the bathroom 10 minutes ago, I don't know why I need to go again, or even urge incontinence, which is I didn't get to the bathroom in time and I've had leakage into my underwear. Um, some of the options that we have for treatment kind of help restore this communication to help for bladder, better bladder control. 
similarly with bowel function, it is communication pathway between the brain and the bowel. And when that communication is disrupted, we see symptoms of fecal incontinence. So there are three different types of bladder control problems. Uh, we'll kind of briefly discuss some of these. There's one called stress incontinence, urinary retention, and overactive bladder. Briefly with stress incontinence, this is leakage that occurs with coughing, sneezing, positional changes, or laughing. Stress urinary incontinence is usually more often caused by muscle weakness. Urinary retention, you cannot tell that your bladder is full and you're unable to fill your bladder completely. This could be both from an obstruction that's in the urinary tract or it could be that there's no obstruction at all from a different issue. And then finally, overactive bladder. I kind of describe overactive bladder to my patients as this umbrella statement we make, but again, you're gonna hear these words a lot, is described as frequency, urgency, or even urge incontinence. Having frequent leakage, not drinking as much because you're worried about leakage, maybe limiting how often you go out or how long your car rides are because you're concerned with having to get to the bathroom. Similarly with fecal incontinence, and a lot of times too, patients that are struggling with Urge incontinence with their bladder will also be struggling with fecal incontinence. The bowel and bladder like to talk to each other and when one's bothered, typically the other one is bothered as well. So there are several different ways that we can go about treating urinary symptoms like urgency, frequency, urge incontinence, as well as fecal incontinence. Dr. Dickinson, do you want to take over? Sure. Okay, so um, basically um, where you start with uh, kind of managing this problem uh, is simple things, uh, avoiding some dietary irritants, um, Exercise is always good and especially weight loss. Um, there is physical therapy that can be done uh, in certain cases to, you know, to help with this problem uh, with regard to the bladder. Um, and again, pelvic floor strengthening or Kegel exercises, which, you know, we, we can instruct patients on uh, regarding that. Next slide. So typically, and, and this is, you know, fairly uh, routine when patients come in and they've got issues with over, overactive bladder, frequency, urgency, um, we're going to try medications first unless there's a, you know, reason not to. If there's, a, you know, a medical contraindication to not taking medications for this problem, you know, we, we go a different route. Um, having said that, you know, medications work great for a lot of people. Um you know, reading this survey, uh, the little bubble off to the right, um, many people stop taking medications uh, in a short period of time, uh, whether that be cost or side effects, which is most typical, um, or quite frankly, they don't work. Um, you know, those are reasons why people will stop taking them. Side effects of a lot of these medications can be pretty unpleasant, uh, dry mouth, blurry vision, constipation, and it can, uh, you know, it can affect your blood pressure as well. Um, and a lot of us have high blood pressure. So that's, you know, that's an issue. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this slide highlights uh, something that we try to fight within urology Austin, and that's retaining patients who come in for this problem. Um, and that starts with education at your first appointment. Let, you know, we, we try to let you know, hey, you know, this is the plan. Uh, we're going to lay out a plan initially. Um, we're going to try a medication. If that doesn't work, we're going to try another medication. If that doesn't work, we moved on to looking at, you know, other options. And that's mainly what this talk is about. Um, so if you look at the, you know, the bottom kind of column or uh, row there, 60% uh, do not return after their initial appointment, 80% do not return after their second appointment, 90 don't come after their third. Um, and again, we, you know, our job is to let you know that, you know, hey, if medications don't work, if lifestyle modification doesn't work, then, you know, we have other options. 
Next slide. Um, so what we talk about here are advanced therapies or, you know, kind of what we call third line therapies in, in uh, urology Austin. Um, bladder and bowel, bowel control are both addressed with this. We're kind of focusing more on the, the bladder control, but uh, the inner stem implant we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, that's more of a permanent solution. Um, Medtronic Neurosystems, that's a nerve stimulation that requires, you know, multiple visits to the office. It is effective. Um, and then there's injected medications uh, in, directly into the bladder, which is essentially Botox. Um, and we're going to get more into detail here in a second. Next slide. So Botox um, is, uh, I'm sure you've heard about it for wrinkles and things like that. Um, it is a an effective treatment for the bladder. Um, I'm going to just stop here and say Botox is not my first line option. Uh, if patients have had it before and they've had success, yeah, I mean, we'll go that route. Uh, I primarily use Botox in the setting of uh, my, you know, sacral neuromodulation inner stem failures. And we're going to talk about that here next. Um, Botox, typically you have to do it about every six months. Uh, you can do it as, as much as often or as often as every three months. Um, it's effective, uh, you know, kind of like medications can be. Uh, there is a low risk, but a you know fairly significant risk of uh, not being able to urinate after Botox that can require a catheterization. Um, and that's you know obviously a downside to that. Uh, next slide. So the uh, PTNS or what they call PTNM, um, this is a weekly, visit to the office um, if you elect to go this route for 12 weeks. Uh, basically, we put a needle in that stimulates the nerve to the bladder um, down uh, near the ankle. Uh, it's about a 20, 30 minute kind of weekly visit for 12 weeks. Typically, you'll see improvement, you know, maybe after week 10, uh, and then it really catches on. Uh, if that works and you're satisfied with it, it's a monthly maintenance schedule coming in once a month to kind of maintain that improvement. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is kind of my go-to, uh, the sacral neuromodulation or the inner stem. Um, same concept, if you look on the slide and look kind of down near the, the buttock area, uh, we insert a a lead that goes and stimulates the nerve to the bladder. Okay, it's pretty superficial. It's not really deep. We're not dealing with the spinal cord. That's one thing I want to be clear on. Um, and you try it out for a week. It's a test drive. We call it a stage one. Um, if that works, then we go in and we implant a uh, uh, essentially a battery underneath the skin in the buttock uh, that connects to that lead and kind of permanently or continuously stimulates the nerve to the bladder. Um, it says here, recharge free and rechargeable device options. Currently, the, the battery that is non-rechargeable lasts plenty long. Um, and, uh, you know, I think up to 10 or 15 years, that's usually what we do with that. Um, what I like to tell people when I'm talking to them about an inner stem, it's a pacemaker. Okay. It's going to calm your bladder down. It's going to regulate it. Um, it's different than a pacemaker for the heart, obviously, but, you know, in essence, it, it does the same thing. Uh, next slide. Um, so I read this slide, um, basically again, um, it says over 375,000 people worldwide. I'm kind of surprised that number is not higher. I've been doing this for 20 years and it feels like I've done a thousand or more of these people. Um, and again, it's a two-stage process either in the office or in the operating room, we put in a lead that stimulates the nerve to the bladder that stays in. There's a trial period of about a week uh, where you wear an external battery. You come in, in my case, I usually bring people in about four days after 90% of the time they've had a you know significant success enough to warrant implanting the battery. Uh, I have gone up to, you know, a couple of weeks in cases uh, that's usually not the case. Usually it's, it's you know, done within a week or so. Uh, but we do have to keep track of, you know, your symptom progress and improvement. We want to see at least a 50% improvement. Usually there's much more than that. Um, 
And, uh, you know, again, uh, I like the inner stem because it's a durable way to deal with it. 80% success at five years. Uh, next slide. Um, this is just to say that, uh, you know, it is now inter or, uh, MRI compatible. A lot of people have concerns. They may have neck problems, back problems, uh, MS, anything else, um, and they need to get MRIs. This is MRI compatible. Um, next slide. Uh, is this therapy right for you? Um, yes, significant symptoms. We've tried, you know, dietary modification, behavioral modification, and uh, medication. They didn't work. Um, and, uh, you know, these treatments, uh, you know, again, didn't work. You want a solution. You're, you're an inner stem candidate. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> says trust a proven therapy, 84, 84% satisfaction for bladder control. Um, it is more effective than medication in most cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, close to 90%, kind of what I said earlier, have long-term success with it. Next slide. Okay. Go past this one. Jessica, do we do anything with this uh, Janet story? You can skip past it if you want. Okay. Yeah. So now is the time for Q and A. Um, yeah. So we have um, one question. Um, so just a reminder to everyone: there's a Q and A box at the bottom. So feel free to put in any questions you might have. Um, this question, I think, is related to Intersem. It says, "Does the battery have to be recharged in some way?" Okay. So. Um, and you know, feel free anybody to jump in if I if I don't get this right. Um, currently, the battery that we're implanting that is uh, you know non rechargeable lasts about possibly up to fifteen years. Um, there is a rechargeable option. Um, since they came out with a new battery that lasts so long, I really haven't gone with it much, but I have implanted some. Uh, and typically, if you are going to go with a rechargeable option, um, you basically wear a belt uh, with a device that goes over the implanted battery. Um, and I think you have to do that about every two weeks. What is the test process like? Can you explain that? So I'll tell you the way that I, I do the majority of mine, um, and it's called a stage one. Um, I usually do these in the operating room just with some sedation and uh, local anesthesia. Um, and again, we put a needle in basically down at the tailbone, feed the lead in, tunnel it under the skin where it exits kind of in your, you know, the side of your buttock. And you wear an external battery for about, you know, usually a week. Um, like I said, after about three days, you'll keep track of your symptoms. Um, you are in control of the device. You actually, you know, can tell it how high you want it to stimulate and you'll be instructed on that. Um, when you come in to see me a few days later, we go over the results and basically objectively and subjectively, if you've had 50% or greater improvement, then we move forward with the, uh, the battery implant and then you're done. That's, that's basically it. Perfect. Um, related to that, Dr. Dickinson, that people are asking, does Medicare cover the cost of this? Absolutely. Um, now, having said that, um, they typically would like documented failure of, you know, a couple of me medications. Um, and, you know, that's why we're going to try medication first. Um, and the second part of it is, again, we want to see a 50 percent uh, improvement in symptoms uh, during the trial period. And again, most of the time, it's much greater than 50% improvement. People are delighted. It can be life-changing. Yes, related to that, someone's asking, could I cut down on the number of catheters I use with this therapy? Uh, it's possible depending on, you know, the reason why you're using a catheter. Um, we use this primarily for what we call idiopathic urinary retention, um, meaning you know, we're not sure why you're in retention. Um, and again, you know, also cases of MS and other neurologic symptoms, uh, that would be an indication for it. Um, 
So yes, um, that's certainly a possibility for a lot of these patients that have that problem. We would like them to be uh, catheter free. This is a longer one. Um, what are the various treatment options for incontinence resulting from removal of the prostate? What works best and what does not work well? And exactly how do you know if you're doing Kegels, Kegels property so properly so that you get results? Okay, let me go to let me go to part one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> When the prostate is removed uh, for cancer in particular, um, that's usually a sphincter issue, a mechanical issue. It's usually different. Um, and that requires an artificial sphincter placement or a sling in men. Um, kind of beyond the scope of this, you know, this uh, this discussion, a uh, different issue. But, um, you know, we take care of that as well. Um and again, um, there are some patients that have prostate issues where the bladder actually is overactive and that's the problem. But in, I think specifically with regard to, uh, you know, stress incontinence following prostatectomy, the gold standard is an artificial sphincter. Um, second part of the question, uh, can you refresh me on that? Yes, it says, <clears throat> how do you know if Kegels are working properly so that you get results? So the best way to do it is to actually see a physical therapist. And we have physical therapists in Urology Austin that that do basically just this. Um, and the idea is that they are going to hook up monitors to kind of tell you, are you contracting the right muscles um, to help with that? And then teach you how to use them properly. And then, you know, you implement the exercises. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Dickinson. Um, so this one's more related to a caregiver. So I'm the caregiver for my husband. Would it be easy for me to work? I'm assuming they're talking about the inner sim and the programmer. Yes. Yes. And uh, our Medtronic reps are great, you know, if there's ever any questions. And we're all, you know, obviously also available for that. Um, but yes, it's it's very user friendly. Perfect. Um, if you have to have open heart surgery, or I guess any surgery in the near future, can you still use the Interson process? Absolutely. In fact, and please, um, Jessica or Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, the only reason, the only contraindication, which is a fancy word for saying why we wouldn't use Interson is in pregnancy. I believe that's the only contraindication. And for patients that have an Interson device in and want to become pregnant, we simply shut off the device. Yeah, that's right. And then do you have to have a real surgery to get it implanted or is it an outpatient surgery? Oh, no, it's it's an outpatient surgery. It's uh, really, I mean, I would classify it in the very minor of uh, minor surgeries. Um. I, someone says, I have the simulator for bladder control, but I now have bowel problems. Can it be used for this? Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, usually the people that put them in for uh, bowel control are the um, colorectal surgeons. Um, you know, I have plenty of patients that have both. I put them in for bladder control they can work as well, you know, if, if they've got both problems, most of the time it, it, you know, cures both of them. Perfect. And then if you're being fairly successful with medication, but the cost is prohibitive um, and or you don't want to continue taking medication, is there a way to get Medicare to cover the cost? So that's a good question. Um, I think if, you know, we documented, um, you know, I mean, in my opinion, okay, if you've got significant side effects from something, it's a failure. Uh, if it's cost prohibitive, it's a failure, okay? If it's not covered, you know, then um, as far as medication goes, then that doesn't work. So yes, um, I believe that that's uh, entirely possible. Great, and then what if constipation seems to be the largest trigger for urgency and frequency? Well, okay, so that's that we're going to go back to uh, kind of lifestyle modification. Um, a good bowel regimen is key, um, you know, and that's 
you know, that's, uh, that's, you know, in and of its own, own problem, um, controlling, uh, constipation, you know, that's, you take care of that. Oftentimes you're going to take care of the bladder problem. Um, and then are PET evaluations okay with this type of device? PET evaluations? Oh, PET scan. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, if this has been around for 25 years, why am I learning about it now? I currently, <laughs> have, I currently have been seeing another urologist. Um, well, I'll, I'll say this, um, the majority of urologists in our group don't do this. Um, there are plenty that do. Um, I don't know why it isn't more, uh, widely practiced. Um, you know, it, it, there's urologists that specialize in cancer. There's, you know, people that pick their own kind of specialty within urology. I have a particular interest in voiding dysfunction. I've been doing this for 20 years as far as putting in inner stem implants. Um, it's a matter of getting educated and finding the right, you know, urologist that that fits you for this. Perfect. Someone is having issues um, at night. So they say, I do decently during the day, but they're up all night, every hour and a half. Would they qualify for the device since it's not 24 by 7 issues? Yes. Um, now, having said that, um, it what I typically do with people that have primarily nighttime voiding problems is we keep track of, you know, both the frequency, how much or how often you're urinating, and then we'll have you measure, you know, are you making two liters of urine at night? That could be a totally different problem that, you know, we can address in a different way uh, with medication. But yes, I mean, uh, you know, nocturia or waking up at night to urinate is you know, part of the spectrum of uh, overactive bladder. Someone was wondering if they would get two devices if you have bladder and bowel problems. So I think we just need to clarify that it would just be one device. So I would say it's one device. Um, I've had two or three patients in my um, my career that have required bilateral uh, two inner stem implants uh, to control, you know, and honestly, remembering back, uh, you know, for overactive bladder, they had one, it didn't work well, we put in a second, it worked, you know, even better. Um, so as far as the bladder and bowel control, um, that's a good question. I honestly haven't put in two implants for that particular reason. Usually one takes care of it. Great. Um, I think there is someone who said that they were supposed to get this done back in December and January, but they switched insurance plans. So we'll just make sure that someone gets in contact with them. They were at the Jollyville office. Okay. Um, but I think at this time, we don't have any more questions unless there's anything else you want to address or if participants, you still have some time if you wanted to ask any more questions in the Q&A box. I see someone else asked, would I be able to get help with this after it's in my body? And we kind of discussed that, but to clarify, absolutely. The device is implanted in your body, but we can access and control the program in your body from via Bluetooth, from a device outside of the body that kind of looks like a phone. You can be as independent with that and use it at home as often as you want, but you are always, always welcome to come into our office with us or with one of the very, very skilled Medtronic rep, reps who can help you with the device, any issues that you have or questions. Thanks, Lucy, I missed that one. <laughs> well, perfect. Well, I don't think there are any other questions right now. So I just wanna thank you both, Lucy and Dr. Dickinson for hosting this event with us tonight. It was extremely infor informative and super grateful for your time. And thank you everyone else for joining us. Um, as you can see on this slide, there is a phone number if you would like to schedule an appointment um, or follow up with anything that was discussed today. You know, every each person is unique, so it's always beneficial to make an appointment and discuss your next options. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Y'all have a good night. <laughs>